an international team of physicists has synthesized an element with 115 protons in the GSI accelerator in Germany. This is not the first time a research group has synthesized the element. A team of Russian and US scientists first made an unpentium in the early 2000s and published a paper about it in 2006. However, at the time, the IUPAC didn't consider that enough evidence to officially recognize or name on Anpentium. The new GSI studies are another step toward official recognition. Element 115 first became of importance to ufologists after being mentioned by Bob Lazar many years ago. Like all super-heavy, synthetic elements, an Anpentium decays quickly. Atoms of an unpentium that researchers made for the 2006 announcement lasted just 30 to 80 milliseconds. The data conflicts with Bob Lazar's statement that element 115 was stable. What is element 115? Is it found here on Earth or is it strictly an extraterrestrial material? 115 is strictly an extraterrestrial material. Uh, it probably occurs naturally in some other places, maybe other star systems. Uh, you know, some people not familiar with science or chemistry say, well, that's ridiculous, all the elements occur on Earth, you know. Uh, but that's not true. There are elements on the periodic chart that aren't found on Earth. I believe the Heavy Ion Research Lab in Darmstadt, Germany, uh, has reached element 112 recently. So 115 isn't, isn't that far away. And when they synthesize it, it's not like they're making a, a couple ounces of it. They're talking about one or two atoms of it. To make any usable quantity of a heavy element like that is virtually impossible. Element 115 is in the top of the reactor. And the base of the reactor apparently is a small, something similar to a cyclotron. It's a particle accelerator. Uh, a particle is accelerated to high speed and then deflected up a small tube and it's aimed at the 115. This transmutes the 115. Uh, similar to the way we, we do that in a normal particle accelerator. Uh, this causes a, a reaction, a radiation emission that we really haven't seen before. Um, it produces antimatter. This antimatter is guided down a tuned tube and reacts with a gas. When matter and antimatter react, they convert to 100% energy. This energy is converted, heat energy, is converted to electrical power in the reactor itself. This is done through a, a thermoelectric converter. And this electrical power is used to power other subsystems on the craft, though there is no wiring, you know, as we would know it. Uh, also, that's almost a byproduct of the reactor. The reactor also sets up a gravitational wave from the 115 being bombarded. This gravitational wave was present at the top of the reactor and is essentially guided in the same way microwaves are guided through tuned tubes. And uh, this goes to their amplifying cavities and through the projectors that are in the bottom of the craft. With the gravity generators running, is there thermal radiation danger to the crew? There is no thermal radiation while the reactor is running. The thermionic generator is 100% efficient, which is in violation of the first law of thermodynamics. But in fact, it works. Element 115 is stable. And for those familiar with chemistry, we know that uh, elements with higher atomic numbers have shorter and shorter half-lives. Um, however, when you reach a certain point, they call it the island of stability. There is a place, and we've theorized this for a long time, somewhere around 114 to 116, there should be an area in there where the nucleus of the atom is geometrically stable with protons and neutrons, where it, it no longer decays. It's not radioactive. 115 is, in fact, this element. In fact, it does occur again, somewhere around element 247. Uh, of course, you know, we're nowhere near synthesizing that. We can only you know, predict things like that, but uh, that's, that's where 115 is. Did they, the aliens, give us element 115 in large quantities? Whether or not it was given to us uh, I, I can't answer that question. However, I was told that we have 500 pounds by one of my co-workers. 
uh, how it was obtained and you know where exactly it came from I don't know whether it came in one of the crafts or you know it was separate cargo somewhere you know, anyone can speculate but I was I was told that was the, the figure you were able to get away with a sample of element 115 how much did you get away with no comment Last month I included a piece on Mr. Jesse Marcel Jr., a guiding light within ufology. It is with great sadness that I must announce the news of his recent passing. He will be missed by many, and I would like to take this time to send my heartfelt condolences to his family and loved ones in this time of sadness. My story for the Roswell part began in the wee hours in the morning of July 1947, when I was awakened by my dad who was returning from an assignment to collect debris of unknown origin from a ranch out of Roswell. The sheriff in Chavez County contacted uh, Colonel Blanchard, who was the commander of the Air Force Base in Roswell. Now, Colonel Blanchard uh, knew my dad was the intelligence officer. So he dispatched my dad and a CIC agent, uh, Sheridan Cavett, to investigate what this was. Our house happened to be on the way to the base, and this is in the wee hours of the morning. So my dad, knowing that he had seen something very special, uh, wanted my mother and myself to look at this also, because uh, as he said, you'll never see this again. Uh, so what he did, he stopped off at the house, awakened my mother and myself, and uh, Again, the wee hours in the morning. It's summertime. I've been playing all day with my bicycles and things like that. Uh, I was 11 years old at the time, however. And uh, he brought us into the kitchen, and I saw a smattering of this uh, strange debris on the kitchen floor that he had pre-positioned. Uh, he said, look at this. I think this is what you call a flying saucer or remains thereof. The debris itself consisted of three components, three types. Uh, there was a, a foil, a, a very tough metallic foil of some nature that I can't really describe. If you fold it over, it would unfold and assume its original form. Uh, in addition, there was uh, black plastic debris, like a broken phonograph record. But the strangest thing I saw was, uh, as being passed around right now, was that this is a replica of one of the eye beams or the beams I saw in the wreckage. Uh, in that you will note there's some symbols written along the inside surface of this and uh, they're a purplish violet hue, semi-reflective of light. My dad uh, uh, drove the debris into the base that night, I think it was that night or maybe early next morning, where he was uh, assigned by Dr. Or Colonel Blanchard to uh, fly the material to General Ramey's office in Fort Worth. This was flown in the belly of a B-29 under armed guard. That's where the cover began, at General Ramey's office. So uh, when my dad got home, he sat my mother and myself down and said in no uncertain terms, you will never talk about this. This is a non-event. Is there anything else you can share with us of your impressions uh, and knowledge of an 11-year-old boy? Well, uh, it was a very Earth awakening experience, or space awakening experience for me. It did make this uh, very, did make me very uh, interested in astronomy and cosmology because I realized that whatever was on the kitchen floor didn't come from here, uh, but came from out there. What else should we know before we get up from here today? Well, I think uh, what it does, it tells us that we are not alone in the universe. As a matter of fact, there's other civilizations out there and they're finding uh, earth-like uh, planets around other star systems every day any civilization that develops into the space travel has gone through a nuclear age and uh, we're still on the precipice of either surviving or not surviving ours but it means they did and if they can do it we can also uh, survive our nuclear warlike tendencies well, as a 76-year-old, you know, I'm no spring chicken. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, you know I, I like to tell my story. I, I, not, I don't embellish it. I'll tell exactly what I knew about this. 
And uh, if people want to believe this, that's okay. If they don't want to believe it, that's also okay. That's their opinion. Uh, I would certainly like to have the government spill the beans about this while I'm still alive to say, I told you so. <laughs> but uh, but I may not be, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. I've, uh, I've been there and done that, so yeah. I know it was.
residents of a Naples, Florida condominium believe that they may have seen a UFO. They reported that a bright saucer-shaped orb hovered over the condo's pool for over a half an hour. Surveillance video captured the alleged UFO. Now, the security guard, Deborah Lee Thomas, told WPTV that it appeared to have webbing that made a funnel into the pool. I believe it. It looks real. I can't. I don't. What is that? Definitely questionable. It's definitely an unidentified flying object. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if you if you just stick with the really technical, uh, you know, version of what a UFO is, then it looks like one. It's unidentified. <laughs> well, people are really curious. But there are, there are pros and cons to this possibly being uh, a UFO. But we're really proud of Deborah Lee for coming out and speaking her choice about. I think it, that she thinks it is a UFO because, you know. You don't want to be known as that lady who thinks UFOs are real. Yeah, well, hey, Russell Crowe tweets about UFOs all the time, and uh, I think he's still doing fine. I think UFOs are out there. I mean, there's a lot of, again, it depends on what you think a UFO really is. You know, there are a lot of military officials, there are generals out there that have released information saying that the, how about how many things they have seen that has been classified all of these years. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's coming from space. Resolved or a cheap publicity stunt? In October of last year, LAX18 told you about an unidentified flying object spotted in the southeastern Kentucky sky. While the company Google has taken responsibility for the strange object, the Pike County amateur astronomer who photographed it says he doesn't buy their explanation. In this week's Mystery Monday, LAX18's Josh Breslow lets you decide. This picture, snapped in October of last year, shows a slim, seemingly cylinder object flying through the sky above Pike County. The photographer, longtime amateur astronomer Alan Epling. When I looked through the doctors, I saw something that I hadn't. I couldn't identify and I had never seen anything like it before. The mystery captured the attention of national media outlets. Police in at least three states were contacted by people who claimed to have seen this unidentified flying object. For each person that can get online, there are two that can't. What folks in Pike County and the surrounding areas witnessed what folks in Pike County and the surrounding areas witnessed, according to Google, was a test of the company's project Loon. The new program consists of balloons that fly high above Earth's surface, forming a communication network. The aim is to bring Internet to a large portion of the world's population who otherwise wouldn't be connected. The photos of balloons that Google launched don't match the video of what I saw. Epling has compared his image to those of Google's balloons, and he says he's not buying the company's explanation. It would be easy for one to say, well, that's my object. I'll take credit for it. And uh, Google may be looking for some cheap publicity. So has Google solved this mystery, or is the company just blowing hot air? You decide. Covering this week's Mystery Monday in Pike County, Josh Breslow, LEX 18 News. LEX18 reached out to Google for comment. While they did say this was, in fact, their Project Loon balloon photographed, they declined to go into further detail. This is the topic of discussion in a quiet suburban Blue Springs community, multicolored orbs hovering in the sky. Robert Cover first noticed it two weeks ago and went to get a closer look. He was confronted by a neighbor who thought he was spying on women until he handed her his binoculars. So I showed her the um, star that was in the sky just to get somebody else's perspective on it and they had said that they'd never seen anything like it before. It's like vibrating lights, red, green, and blue. And it's nothing I've ever seen before. And with their binoculars, we could see fairly well, but still it was, you know, off in the distance. I can barely see some color. Teresa Price saw it as well, at least twice. The same night Becky and Robert did, and again when she was walking her dogs the following week. This time, things were even more bizarre. It was up in the sky and just dropped, you know, how many feet, I don't know, but it just dropped and then stayed stationary in that lower position. Teresa had seen our recent news report on domestic drones that are now being used by local governments and law enforcement agencies. She thought that's what it was. Kind of made me think about that. It's like, okay, is this some sort of a drone that's out there for why it's out at night? I don't know. Robert called the KCTV5 investigative hotline and posted a sighting on a UFO spotter's website. The night of our interview, we spotted similar sightings. This is the enhanced video of what we saw. Robert was contacted by Margie Kay with the Missouri UFO Network. She decided to investigate for herself the following night. Kay interviewed everyone who claimed to have seen the UFOs and then set up telescopes to watch the sightings herself. Neighbors came out hoping to see similar activity that captivated the community. Can you see, can you see it now? As the sky darkened, one of them appeared. 
but Kay initially dismissed it. Well, I'm 90% certain that we're looking at Vega in this instance and that uh, there are you know, some other planets out right now. But she came to a different conclusion after others started appearing. Oh, no, no. And after she put in a call to a colleague in another part of the state to take a closer look at what she thought was Vega, that person described it as pure white. That's not what we're seeing. We're seeing some colors in this. Um, I see red and green in this one, and in this one behind me, I see um, red, green, and blue. I don't think it's a planet. Uh, at this point, I don't know what it is. It's unidentified. We've got some new information this morning about Area 51. You know it, long thought to be a secret government site in Nevada's desert. As it turns out, all those conspiracy theorists were right. Sort of. <laughs> NBC's Mars you have a compass got that story. Hey. They're vindicated this morning. Good morning, guys. Well, for the first time, the U.S. government has confirmed the existence of Area 51. But while they are finally acknowledging it and its location, much to the dismay of sci-fi fans, they make no mention of UFOs or spaceships. Conspiracy theory confirmed. The U.S. government has finally recognized the existence of Area 51. According to recently declassified documents obtained by the National Security Archive at George Washington University, the military air base is 125 miles northwest of Las Vegas. Until now, it never officially existed, with all references to the area redacted from government files. They're no longer pretending the place doesn't exist. That's the first step to getting a lot more information in the future. That secrecy made the site the frequent subject of conspiracy theories, particularly that it was used to secretly hide alien spaceships dramatized on TV and in movies. Take my word for it, there's no Area 51. That's not entirely accurate. No mention of flying saucers in the documents, but instead a different kind of flying. Turns out Area 51 was created as a test site for the Lockheed U-2, a spy plane used by the CIA during the Cold War. They obviously didn't want the Soviet Union to know about it, and to ensure that they wanted a facility where it could be tested away from everybody else. Area 51 has seen some out-of-this-world action. Apollo astronauts trained there for the moon landing. Thornton Barnes, a radar and missile electronics engineer at the site, was forced to keep his work a secret from family and friends for decades. My wife was mad at me when she found out I was working only 85 miles from home. She had no idea where we were and thought it was in some other country. Area 51 has actually been one of the government's worst kept secrets. The map just released by the CIA matches one you could previously find on the internet by Googling Area 51. <laughs> <laughs> so, so much for classified. Well, Natalie's totally depressed they didn't have UFOs. I'm sure they're still doing alien autopsies. I'm sure. <laughs>
search for life beyond Earth goes on, but it doesn't come cheap. Just ask the people who run the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, better known as SETI. It's a mission director Steven Spielberg might have dreamed up. This dedicated team of scientists don't lack his imagination, just his bank account. 42 radio telescopes scan outer space from the northern mountains of California, night and day. At two and a half million dollars a year, it's an expensive job. So when the money dried up, so did the search for aliens. Strapped for cash, the Institute had to shut down earlier this year. But an online fundraising drive called SETI Stars was set up and has now raised nearly $230,000. Five months later, they're back up and running for now. SETI Stars was wonderful. In 45 days, they stepped up to a $200,000 funding challenge. Um, and that will help us get out of hibernation and keep us working for a couple of months. And for those who've donated, giving is believing, no matter how long the odds. You get teased, you know, I'm sure scientists at the time were teasing them for that, but it's, it's very logical science to ask if there's anything else out there. It's very logical science to ask if you're alone, and it's logical to just keep wondering, and so that's kind of inspiring. More donations will be needed. The quest for intelligent life seems as endless as the effort to pay for it.
If you have enjoyed this episode of Max UFO News, then please be sure to like, comment and subscribe for future updates. Bye for now, and thanks for watching.